Hopefully we all have stories. Mine is horrific. Like, why didn't you say something then? Because we just want to live. We want to be happy. And we really want to forget the trauma. Since then, I've been like, yep, I have a lot of stories, y'all. Maybe I'll write a book one day. Law enforcement had enough to get the search warrant. They maybe even have enough to get an indictment. And if One of Sean Diddy Combs' former backup dancers has spoken up about a disturbing incident that occurred during their time working together in the 90s. An Instagram video by former extra host Tanika Ray detailed her experience, showing how she learned to avoid combs for her own safety. This news follows reports that federal officials raided two of Combs' Miami and Los Angeles houses in what are believed to be related sex trafficking investigations. And now we're going to turn to Sean Diddy Combs, the investigation, and new images of the raids on the rappers' homes. Federal agents reportedly looking for evidence to back up allegations of sexual assault made by most. A man is accusing Sean Diddy Combs of drugging his alleged sex assault victims. That's one of the new details we're learning tonight about the sex trafficking allegations against the music mogul. Ray's disclosure follows another unsettling account from Toure, who spoke about a relative's encounter with Combs. According to Toure, Combs allegedly pressured his relative, an intern, to spend the night with him under the threat of losing the internship. How you feel about the news that broke that Diddy, he gave up the rest of his shares and revolt? Listen, there is no, he has to do that. While Ray didn't go into specifics about her experience, she mentioned maintaining professional boundaries with Combs, even during events like his citizen change campaign in 2004. She also noted interactions with him during her time at Extra. And then there's nothing. I'm just telling you right now. D, D was just collecting money for Nick. You know what I'm saying? Yo, man, we got to make sure because he want to kill himself. He going to kill himself. Ray confessed to keeping silent about her ordeal for years, fearing potential backlash. Regardless of the backlash, she emphasized the need to put one's mental health and safety first. She went on to mention that Combs had been the subject of a private settlement following a lawsuit brought by Cassie Ventura, who had accused him of abuse. Cassie made a daring move on November 16th when she sued Diddy in federal court, accusing the powerful hip-hop figure of rape and a history of abuse spanning 10 years. Cassie was only 19 years old when their history began. Cassie claims she was a victim of sex trafficking and gender-motivated assault while signed to Bad Boy Records, Diddy's record label. The lawsuit states that Cassie first encountered Diddy's domineering behavior in 2005. She states that he dictated her living situation and medical records, among other things, once she signed with his record label the next year, and that he exerted total power over her life. Even musicians like Kid Cootie, who were close to Cassie, are named as targets of Diddy's claimed harassment in the case. Curiously, Cassie and Diddy were able to settle out of court the very day after Cassie filed the complaint. Nevertheless, this was only the beginning. More and more people came forward with accusations of sexual assault against Diddy as information continued to surface. March saw federal officials investigating Miami and Los Angeles houses owned by Diddy, all in the name of an alleged sex trafficking case. The allegations in Cassie's complaint are deeply troubling, as they detail her claimed fall into a violent and abusive relationship after being enticed into what appeared to be a protective connection at first. According to Cassie, Diddy used intimidation tactics like destroying property and issuing threats, which made her feel confined and afraid. Despite the seriousness of the allegations, Diddy has denied them. Once they became romantically involved, Diddy and his inner circle allegedly took complete control over every aspect of Cassie's life. The lawsuit paints a troubling picture of how those close to the founder of Bad Boy Records turned a blind eye to the physical abuse she endured. According to the suit, Beatings were witnessed by Diddy's staff and employees, yet no one felt empowered to speak out against their intimidating boss. Cassie shared that she refrained from seeking help from the police out of fear that it would only escalate the situation. In one particularly harrowing incident in 2009, she alleges Diddy kicked her repeatedly in the face, causing her to bleed, and then had his staff hide her away in a hotel room. Despite her attempts to escape, she felt constantly pursued by Diddy's extensive network of companies and employees who pressured her to return to him, even suggesting that her career in the entertainment industry depended on it. The lawsuit also highlights the toll the relationship took on Cassie's mental health, detailing instances of substance abuse leading to memory loss and suicidal thoughts. 
It even mentions MRI results being directed to Diddy directly, indicating the extent of his control. The legal action names Diddy, whose real name is Sean Combs, along with several associated business entities, suggesting a systemic complicity in the alleged abuse. Cassie is seeking unspecified compensatory damages for the trauma she endured. In a particularly disturbing revelation, the lawsuit mentions instances where Cassie was coerced into participating in what were described as freak-offs. These events involved her planning and engaging in sexual acts with male sex workers while Diddy observed. The encounters allegedly took place over several years in upscale hotels across the country, sometimes occurring as frequently as once a week. Cassie recounts futile attempts to delete videos of these encounters, only to be confronted with them again, even on a flight where she believed she had successfully removed the footage. It was reported in 2016 that Diddy paid a hotel $50,000 to delete security footage, showing him in a violent outburst, allegedly giving Cassie a black eye and then tossing glass vases at her. In order to numb herself from the trauma she had experienced, Cassie turned to excessive drug use, which the lawsuit describes in graphic detail, including ecstasy, cocaine, and others. Substance addiction was a tragic outcome of this need. The lawsuit also alleges a retaliatory act by Diddy in 2012, where he's accused of orchestrating the destruction of Kid Cootie's car following the rapper's brief relationship with Cassie. Kid Cudi himself confirmed this account, shedding light on the intensity of the situation. The lawsuit also reveals the terrible fact that Diddy allegedly raped Cassie in 2018 when she was at home alone, despite her cries for help. Cassie finally left Diddy for real after this horrible incident broke her. She made a clean break from her prior associations in 2019 when she terminated relations with Bad Boy Records. Regarding the settlement, Specifics are not to be disclosed. Diddy expressed his willingness to resolve the case peacefully, and the agreement was rapidly struck just one day after Cassie filed the lawsuit. Diddy avoided the prospect of fresh negative material emerging during legal procedures by choosing an out-of-court settlement. Diddy has denied the allegations, and his lawyer has wished Cassie the best, but he has stressed that settling does not mean admitting guilt. The Adult Survivors Act, enacted by a New York law, paved the way for Cassie to take legal action. This act permits victims of sexual assault who were 18 or older when the abuse occurred to bring claims within one year after any statutes of limitations have expired. With this window closing soon, Cassie saw it as an opportunity to speak out about the trauma she endured. She emphasized the importance of holding her abuser and those who enabled him accountable for their actions thanks to the passage of this act in New York and California. In response to Cassie's allegations, singer-songwriter Tiffany Redd came forward with her own account, supporting Cassie's claims. Redd recalled incidents where she witnessed Diddy's abusive behavior towards Cassie, including a disturbing episode at Cassie's birthday party. Redd described feeling compelled to speak out despite the power imbalance, citing moments when speaking truth to power becomes necessary. In the meantime, 50 Cent has stated his intention to create a documentary centering on the sexual assault charges against Diddy. Victims of sexual assault and rape will receive support from the project's proceeds. Mark Curry, a rapper from Bad Boy Records, revealed unsettling details about Diddy's alleged drugging of women without their consent in a teaser clip that brought attention to the alleged milieu of excess and immorality. G-Unit Film and Television will be behind the production of the documentary. In the middle of the claims, Kesha altered her 2009 single TikTok significantly. While the original opening lyric read, Wake up in the morning feeling like P. Diddy, Kesha changed it to, Wake up in the morning feeling like me. At a performance on November 19th, it was a small change, but it seemed to reflect how people felt about the claims at the time. At the same time, 50 Cent added his two cents to the controversy in an Instagram post that has since been removed. He dropped hints that Diddy might still be in a sticky situation, implying that settling down fast might not have been the final chapter. Based on what he said, further accusers may come forward after the settlement. Aubrey O'Day, a former member of Danity Kane, also spoke out in Cassie's defense, highlighting her efforts to bring attention to these concerns. Cassie's courageous decision to come out was recognized by her former bandmate, Don Richard, who, echoing O'Day's feelings, offered prayers and words of encouragement to Cassie and her family. Regarding Diddy, 
he has categorically rejected all claims made against him. He vented his anger at what he saw as efforts to discredit him in a tweet he posted on December 6. Diddy insisted he was innocent, implying that the allegations were motivated by greed rather than fairness. The music mogul was already facing growing allegations of sexual assault when Cassie's case added to the deluge of subsequent lawsuits filed against him. Lil Rod's actual name, Rodney Jones, lawsuit takes the allegations a step further by stating that Diddy was involved in a shooting incident that occurred at a Los Angeles recording studio. As reported by NBC News, Lil Rod's updated complaint provides more details regarding an alleged confrontation that took place inside Chalice Recording Studio between Justin, Diddy's son, and Rod. <laughs> According to the first document, Justin, Diddy, and someone named G got into an argument in the studio's restroom. Lil Rod then asserts that following Justin and Diddy's departure from the bathroom, he discovered a shot of G on the floor. It is said that Diddy told the producer to tell the cops he was innocent. On February 27, however, Justin refuted these claims. Those implicated are facing prosecution, and the Los Angeles Police Department has verified Diddy's involvement in the inquiry. However, they have stressed that the incident did not place at or near the studio. A private investigator linked to Diddy allegedly tried to bribe a close friend of Lil Rod to supply harmful information about him, according to the updated complaint. Diddy is facing multiple charges in the first case, which spans over a year and includes allegations of drugging, sex trafficking, and harassment. A 73-page lawsuit detailing Lil Rod's allegations of abuse by Diddy during their collaboration on the Grammy-nominated album, The Love Album. Off the Grid was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. According to the lawsuit, there is video evidence that shows Diddy and his inner circle involved in criminal acts. The footage is hundreds of hours long. Screenshots purportedly showing Diddy's parties with sex workers and underage females, some of whom were allegedly given spiked beverages at Diddy's order, are also included. Defendants in the court document include Justin Diddy, Lucian Grange, CEO of Universal Music Group, Ethiopia Habtamarium, former CEO of Motown Records, and Christina Corum, Diddy's head of staff, as well as Justin's father, Diddy, and other prominent members of the music industry. The legal team representing Jones claims that Diddy and his collaborators constitute a RICO enterprise, and that this group was responsible for the failure to rein in Diddy and his associates. Worryingly, the charges against Diddy and his accomplices cover a lot of ground. Jones was allegedly pressured into planning and engaging in sexual encounters with others, including Justin, Diddy's son. Jones further claims that Diddy threatened physical violence against him if he did not comply with his demands that he was coerced into using narcotics against his choice, and that he endured persistent, unwanted touching. In a show of dominance, the lawsuit claims that Diddy boasted about letting rapper Shine take the blame for a 1999 shooting incident and avoiding punishment. The complaint states that Christina Corum, Diddy's chief of staff, characterized the abuse as friendly horseplay, suggesting that Diddy's actions were only an expression of his affection when Jones tried to speak out about Diddy's behavior. Jones asserts that he was never paid for his contributions to the Love album and that he is also the victim of sexual assault accusations. While Universal Music Group, Love Records, Motown Records, and Diddy all made money off of their efforts, Jones allegedly didn't get paid for his work. Jones, in his pursuit of reparation, has filed a massive $30 million damages suit. The continuous issues surrounding Diddy make this latest legal action against him predictable. Prior to the Lil Rod case, on December 6th, a different woman named Jane Doe sued Sean Diddy Combs, stating that she had been a victim of horrific sex trafficking, gender-motivated violence, and gang rape at the tender age of 17. The complaint states that in 2003, the adolescent plaintiff met Diddy, record executive Harve Pierre, and a third person at a Detroit-area nightclub. The lawsuit paints a disturbing picture of how the defendants allegedly preyed on the vulnerable teenager enticing her with drugs and alcohol before transporting her via private jet to New York City, where she was purportedly gang-raped at Diddy's studio. Jane Doe's attorney, Douglas H. Wigdor, expressed the profound impact these horrific acts have had on his client, stating that they have left lasting scars. Before leaving the lounge, the filing alleges that Pierre forced the plaintiff to perform oral sex. Upon arriving at Daddy's House recording studio, the plaintiff claims she was given excessive amounts of drugs and alcohol and then sexually assaulted by all three men in the studio bathroom. 
Shockingly, the plaintiff recalls Diddy watching as the third unidentified associate assaulted her. She was then flown back to Michigan. Included in the filing are images depicting the plaintiff sitting on Diddy's lap in the studio on the night in question. This lawsuit marks the fifth sexual assault claim against Diddy in recent weeks. Following R&B singer Cassie's lawsuit on November 16th, which alleged similar offenses, Cassie settled the following day. Responding to the allegations, Diddy took to Twitter on December 6th, vehemently denying the charges and condemning what he perceived as attempts to tarnish his reputation. He accused the victims of seeking quick financial gain before reaffirming his innocence. The filing indicates that Jane Doe found the courage to speak out after witnessing others step forward. Over last Thanksgiving weekend, Combs found himself facing a flurry of legal troubles, with two separate lawsuits alleging sexual assault and a third accusing his company of negligence and workplace violence. The first lawsuit was brought by a former Syracuse University student who accuses Combs of drugging and sexually assaulting her, filming the act, and then distributing it as a form of revenge porn, as reported by Rolling Stone. In the second lawsuit, Combs and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall are accused of rape and assault against the plaintiff and her friend back in 1990 or 1991. According to Rolling Stone, just days after the alleged assault, Combs purportedly returned to the victim's residence and violently attacked them. Additionally, a woman named Pierre filed a sexual assault and workplace harassment lawsuit against Pierre and Diddy's business entities. She alleges a year-long pattern of grooming by Pierre, which eventually turned violent on multiple occasions between 2016 and 2017, according to USA Today. Further allegations emerged in the wake of Cassie's lawsuit. In a 2019 interview with Virginia V, she detailed alleged instances of physical abuse. Speaking with controversial internet personality Tasha Kay, Diddy's ex-girlfriend accused him of stomping on her stomach, punching her, and attempting to pay her to abort their child. Virginia V, also known as Gina Huing, described the abuse as both physical and emotional, claiming that those around Diddy allowed it to happen. She recalled feeling constantly compared to Cassie and being told she was the bad one. In 2017, Diddy faced a lawsuit from his former personal chef, Cindy Ruela, which included allegations of sexual harassment, failure to pay overtime, and retaliation. Ruela claimed that Diddy would often request food service immediately after engaging in sexual activity, with him and his friends sometimes being naked during these post-coital meals. In one instance, Diddy even asked Ruela if she liked his body. The lawsuit was settled in 2019, but the terms of the settlement were not disclosed. Before this, Diddy had been involved in various other incidents. In 2015, he allegedly assaulted his son's football coach. Rumors circulated in 2012 about a confrontation between Diddy and Cutie at a club. Additionally, in 2007, he was sued for allegedly ordering an assault on a promoter. Going back to the 90s, Diddy pleaded guilty to a reduced assault charge after attacking the president of Interscope Records with a chair, a telephone, and a champagne bottle. This altercation stemmed from a NAS music video that Diddy found blasphemous due to its depiction of two men being crucified. Around 25 years ago, three NYPD detectives received a call to head over to the Midtown North Precinct in the wee hours of a chilly winter night. Rap mogul Sean Combs, then going by the name Puffy, his girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, and his bodyguard Jamal Shine Barrow, who was also a rapper, had been apprehended after a shooting incident inside a Times Square club that left three bystanders injured. When the detectives arrived, they found Lopez, then 30, detained in the cage. Combs was also at the station house on West 54th Street, his plans for a grand millennium celebration a few days later temporarily put on hold. Now, the events of that night and the subsequent high-profile trial in early 2001 are once again making headlines. According to sources within law enforcement, there's a possibility that the infamous shooting and trial could be reinvestigated as part of a broader federal probe into Combs, who is now 54 and goes by the name Diddy. His past includes more than one incident involving mysterious shootings. This Monday, Homeland Security agents descended upon Combs' residences in Los Angeles and Miami in a series of raids, reportedly spurred by allegations of sex trafficking. 
According to New York criminal defense attorney Michael Dishioaro, who is familiar with the case, the federal agents are actively gathering information from witnesses in Miami. They're striving to corroborate every detail regarding the allegations against Diddy. Essentially, everything from his past to the present is under scrutiny at this moment. In his lawsuit, Jones made some serious allegations against Diddy, claiming the music mogul was violent, even threatening to eat his face, and often boasted about bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case related to the 1999 NYC nightclub shooting involving Shine. The nightclub shooting incident stemmed from a confrontation between Diddy and a Brooklyn figure known as Scar. Diddy, along with his bodyguard Anthony Jones and Shine Barrow, faced a lengthy trial lasting seven weeks in February and March 2001. Ultimately, Diddy and Jones were acquitted, while Barrow, then 21, was convicted on charges of assault and gun possession, receiving a 10-year prison sentence. Even after all these years, the Club New York shooting remains shrouded in mystery, particularly for former Detective Parker, who was part of the so-called hip-hop cop squad in the NYPD and is now working as a private investigator. There have long been rumors surrounding Diddy's involvement in the incident, with some suggesting he may have influenced Shine to take the blame. According to Parker, the altercation arose when Diddy was flaunting his wealth, which didn't sit well with Scar, who felt slighted. This led to a heated exchange of words and, eventually, gunfire erupted. After shots rang out, Lopez and Diddy hurriedly left the club in a Lincoln Navigator, according to Diddy's driver, Wardell Fenderson. They sped through the streets, bypassing red lights and maneuvering past police cars. Fenderson recalled Lopez's words during the chaotic escape, mentioning Shine firing a weapon into the air, moments before they were stopped by law enforcement. Former NYPD detective Derek Parker recounted the scene at the precinct, where Lopez's mother expressed her anger in Spanish, chastising her daughter for getting involved with Diddy. Despite spending 14 hours in custody, Lopez was eventually released without charges. Natanya Rubin, one of the three victims of the club shooting, has persistently claimed that Diddy shot her in the face during the altercation. Jones, in his lawsuit against Diddy, alleges that Diddy openly boasted about the nightclub shooting and manipulated witnesses and jurors to secure his freedom. Moreover, Jones claims Diddy bragged about Lopez smuggling the gun into the club for him, passing it to him during the altercation. Adding another perspective, Glenn Beck, who was working security at the club that night, testified at the trial but expressed skepticism about Jones's claims. Beck suggested that Shine's actions were the catalyst for the shooting, not Diddy's directives. According to Beck, Shine fled the club after a confrontation and returned moments later, instigating the gunfire. He was swiftly apprehended by police outside. While Shine admitted to firing a weapon during the incident, there has been no assertion thus far that Diddy coerced him into taking the blame. On Monday afternoon, a helicopter from Fox 11 captured footage of a significant law enforcement presence at what was believed to be Sean Diddy Combs's mansion in Holmby Hills, West LA. Videos showed Homeland Security Investigations, HSI agents entering the property with weapons drawn and escorting several individuals out while executing a search warrant. The Los Angeles Police Department also had a presence, securing the surrounding area. When asked about the operation involving Combs, a spokesperson for Homeland Security Investigations provided a statement to USA Today, explaining that HSI New York led the action with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and local law enforcement partners. But what exactly do these law enforcement actions entail? According to Rebecca Lonergan, a professor at USC Gould School of Law and associate director of the Legal Writing and Advocacy Program, HSI's involvement, especially in tandem with recent civil lawsuits against Combs, suggests a potential sex trafficking investigation with the possibility of criminal charges. It means they've got evidence of criminality, she says. They're looking for corroboration of that evidence. She notes that the coordinated execution of search warrants across multiple locations indicates a significant advancement in the investigation. Search warrants typically occur before charges are filed, but they're not typically one of the first steps because they openly target the individual, she adds. According to Tree Lovell, an entertainment attorney at the Lovell firm in Los Angeles, the recent law enforcement raids targeting Combs signify a significant escalation in the legal proceedings against him. The way they orchestrated the raids, it was two different homes, 
same exact time with a clear organizational element shows a couple of things, Lovell says. A, they're very serious. And B, they needed the element of surprise because they want to avoid the destruction of evidence, so they needed the surprise on both coasts at the same time. The raids could mean there's more legal action to come for Combs, says Judy Saunders, a partner with Ask LLP and an attorney who specializes in sex abuse and human trafficking cases. These raids could indicate that there's more legal trouble on the horizon for Combs, suggests Judy Saunders, a partner at Ask LLP specializing in sex abuse and human trafficking cases. When a federal agency executes a search warrant, it's a strong indication that there's probable cause to suspect the commission of a federal crime, Saunders notes. For Mr. Combs, this could mean impending charges in the near future, either against him personally or his business entities. Furthermore, Saunders adds that such charges could lead to the freezing of business assets and restrictions on Combs' movements. Rebecca Lonergan sheds light on the process behind obtaining search warrants for the recent raids on Combs' properties. To get a warrant, you have to present a sworn affidavit to a federal judge with enough evidence to establish probable cause, she explains. This means there needs to be a strong belief that there's evidence of criminal activity at the locations being searched. Given that the raids targeted two locations, multiple federal judges' approval was necessary. Prosecutors involved in the investigation would have thoroughly reviewed the affidavit before it reached the judge's desk, ensuring that they agreed on the sufficiency of the evidence. Lonergan emphasizes that these searches signify a full-blown criminal investigation, with judges in each district finding probable cause to support the warrants for Combs's properties. In response to media speculation, Combs' lawyer clarified that neither Combs nor his family members were arrested or had their travel restricted. However, this doesn't rule out the possibility of future charges. Agents can execute search warrants and arrest warrants at the same time. They didn't, Lonergan points out. This could mean several things. Either the searches yielded no incriminating evidence, or prosecutors are taking their time to build a solid case against Combs. Lonergan explains that if prosecutors were ready to bring criminal charges against Combs, he would have been arrested during the raids. However, the absence of immediate charges doesn't necessarily mean the investigation is over. There's also another possibility they go in and they find a bunch of evidence. Then they've got a whole bunch of new stuff to investigate, Lonergan says. The bigger the cases, the longer they take to come to charges. And in all honesty, when it's high profile, the Department of Justice and the prosecutors are slower to charge because they don't want to charge something wrong in the public eye. So, let's dive into what might happen if Combs faces criminal charges and heads to court. It's possible that details from his previous civil cases, even those under non-disclosure agreements, could resurface. Alleged victims like Cassie might find themselves called to testify. Judy Saunders, an attorney specializing in sex abuse and human trafficking cases, explains that while courts are usually cautious about introducing prior bad acts of the accused, attorneys might try to admit such evidence. As for Cassie, Ann Oliverius, a legal expert in sexual harassment and assault cases, points out that if she's subpoenaed, she'll have to testify, though there might be debates about what she can disclose. Oliverius sees Cassie's lawsuit as a call to action for others to come forward and speak their truth. She views Cassie's legal settlement as a significant victory, noting that Combs essentially admitted fault by agreeing to pay up. Now, let's talk legacy. Saunders highlights the importance of who controls the narrative surrounding an individual. While some may advocate for separating the person from their work or celebrating their achievements, Saunders emphasizes that the impact on families affected by the individual's actions shouldn't be ignored. That should not be covered over because the person was able to contribute to a catalog of music. That's all for the video, folks. Thanks for watching.